Hello and welcome to a master class in Mariology. This is Dr. Mark Miravalli. I am joined by my longtime colleague and friend, Dr. Robert Festigi. And in this program, we're going to begin uh, what I consider to be uh, a message of massive historic and spiritual importance, the message of Fatima. Uh, it, it's one of those messages where one fears that regardless how comprehensive uh, we get, uh, we, we will not do Fatima justice. And I'm, I'm mindful, Robert, of uh, my dear friend who just recently died, uh, Ambassador Howard D. from the Philippines, who met with Cardinal Ratzinger and asked Cardinal Ratzinger, why is there not an encyclical on Fatima? And Cardinal Ratzinger responded, well, to do an encyclical on Fatima is like doing an encyclical on the gospel. So uh, welcome to the program. Thanks, as always, for being with us. Oh, you're welcome, Mark. This is... Uh you know, a wonderful opportunity. And I have been privileged to be at Fatima twice, and I'm sure you've been there uh, numerous times. Yes, it's a it's a it's a geography of grace without any question. Well let's start with just again some background. Let's talk about, you know, why Fatima, the significance of the name Fatima. If you could just kind of give us an overview, Robert, that would be a, a great initiation. Well, yes. Now, uh, according to uh, what we know from tradition, there was this small village of Fatima was named after a young Muslim woman who was captured by the Portuguese after a victory over the Muslims in 1158. So we have to remember that uh, around the early part of the 8th century, all of Iberia, Spain and Portugal was conquered by the Muslims. Mm -hmm. uh, 711 is given. But then gradually there was what is called in Spanish la reconquista, the reconquering mm -hmm. of Iberia. And uh, and so there were a number of battles. So what happened in 1158, the Portuguese were seeking to reconquer the territories that had been taken over by the Muslims in the 8th century. And there was a young woman named Fatima, uh, uh, the name Fatima comes from one of the daughters of Muhammad. Right. And the, according to reports, one, this young woman named Fatima in the 12th century was uh, captured and a Portuguese knight, Gonzalo uh, Ramirez, fell in love with her. And he asked for her hand in marriage and Fatima agreed and was baptized a Catholic with the name Oriana which means the golden one. Mm -hmm. But then sadly, Fatima or Oriana died soon after the wedding. And heartbroken, Gonzalo eventually entered a monastery. He did, though, have a small chapel built over the site where his young bride's body was buried. And the site came to be known as Fatima. And, Isn't and, that and, remarkable? I mean, the, and, and, and the continuity of that and... I, I can't but think of a Fulton Sheen who said, look, I don't think there's going to be a unity of, of Christianity and Islam except through Our Lady, uh, because uh, they uh, Muslims do have devotion uh, to the mother of Jesus. However, um, inconsistent that might be, because Jesus is not their primary, quote, prophet. It's, it's Muhammad. And yet um, Mary is the most cherished woman in Islam. She has her own book. In the Quran, uh, no other woman is treated in the Quran as Our Lady is. So it just seems that the fact that Fatima, Muslim, you know, woman, then married, and then um, yeah, indeed, the 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 young prince goes into the monastery. Uh, but I think all that's significant, Robert. I think that's all uh, kind of providential about Muslim and Christianity through Our Lady. Yes, and that's what Archbishop Fulton Sheen said. Of all the places in Portugal. <laughs> to appear, the Blessed Mother chose a place that had that had a Muslim name attached to it, and showing that you know Our Lady will be the the one who will bring uh, Muslims to really understand who Jesus is, right. and right. that he's he's not just a prophet and messenger of God; he is the Word of God incarnate through the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. I mean, Muslims believe Maryam. Maryam was a virgin when she gave birth to the prophet Jesus. I think that's like an indication. This was miraculous. And so she had a miraculous purpose in life. 
It's certainly true. And, you know, to their credit, Islam also defends uh, the Immaculate Conception and Our Lady's virginity against the Jewish Talmud, which makes really rather uh, blasphemous references of the origins of, of Jesus through a Roman guard with Mary and, and things that are really uh, abominable. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's Islam uh, defense of her virginity, her Immaculate Conception, and even a reference to uh, Our Lady's Assumption uh, by inference is also part of Islam. Also, Muslims go to Fatima to pray. Uh, 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 Muslims go to, uh, you know, Marian uh, shrines in, in parts of the Middle East as well. So there's there's certainly that dimension, of course, uh, no one better than the mother to bring them from the idea of Jesus as a prophet to Jesus as God, the Son made man through her. Uh, so there's certainly progress, but uh, I think Sheen's uh, completely right. It, it'll be through the mother. Who is who? The, the mother of all peoples. That's what that title means. She's not just mother of the church. She is certainly and powerfully mother of the church, but she's also mother of all peoples. So anything more on the history uh, of uh, and uh, the the dimension of, of uh, yeah. the location that you want to get into? Because I, I would like, uh, if it's good with you, Robert, to talk about the, the angelic apparitions at yeah. Fatima, because they're so often, uh, you know, uh, kind of lost in focus because of the, you know, legitimate power of the true messages. But, you know, of course, we've got the miraculous medal. We've got Lourdes. Uh, we've got La Salette, which really precedes Lourdes. And so this is all kind of warming up uh, to the 20th century. Uh, and she comes in 1917 under that title, Our Lady of the Rosary, which which has such, uh, such a power and such a significance in terms of Our Lady being the greatest creature, Satan yeah. being the most heinous creature, and in the 13th century, giving us that gift uh, through St. Dominic uh, of the rosary. But, uh, yeah, any any other elements regarding, uh, you know, the Fatima historically that uh, you think would be important? I think it is important to mention that Portugal had been a deeply Catholic country, and to some extent still is, but there were movements of secularization and Freemasonry and also communism circulating in Iberia at this time. And so uh, Fatima occurred during World War I. But even before that, this is from the selected Fatima documentation from the, uh, from, from the shrine of, of Fatima, which was, uh, it came out in Portuguese and Italian and now uh, more recently in English. But it just says that the political turmoil and ecclesiastical concerns of 1917 had had more recent antecedents than this. The difficulties in which Catholicism had found itself since the dawn of liberalism continued and worsened with the outbreak of the Republican Revolution in 1910 and the subsequent law of separation of 1911. The church was confronted with a new legal landscape as the new political powers withdrew the status of Catholicism as an official religion and consequently did not allow its role in social construction that liberalism had amid its contradictions uh, and uh, recognized. And it was not, however, this new global framework that most perplexed the, church, perplexed the church, given the reflection on the uncertainty of the forms of government that the church had, but th this is what happened. There, there were upheavals and there was a pro policy of secularization or laicization and through a set of measures gradually changed the feature of Portuguese Catholicism. The Jesuits were expelled and religious congregations were disbanded and their assets confiscated. Religious oaths were abolished. The teaching of religion in primary and normal schools was prohibited and the theology faculty at the University of Coimbra was closed down. Holy days were extinct, civil marriages became obligatory, and divorce was made possible. This yeah. was all going on since 1911. Now, the bishops of Portugal, to their credit, protested, and they were able to win some, measure, uh, uh, some uh, degree of freedom of religion. But there was this, this strong anti-Catholic movement. I, Robert, I think most people are not aware of exactly what you just described, the fact that 
this was not just a, a general church and state situation. This was a absolute persecution of the church uh, and a strong Masonic dimension and secular and uh, as you mentioned, you know, uh, ruminations of communism. But the, the masonry was was very intense and very high in government. And in light of that, it, it reminds us that the mother comes where her children are in greatest need. And so uh, the idea that a bunch of people are having gatherings outside uh, give the appearance of a social uh, revolution, right? That, that, that the people are revolting. Uh, it, it's quite opposite. Although in a real sense, it does have that because the dimension uh, of, of Our Lady's spiritual revolution is very powerful at Fatima. But from the secular's perspective, this is all disobedience to the new laws. This is revolting. Uh, and that's why it's interesting that um, for the fourth apparition, as we'll talk about, uh, the children are, are taken away by the officials. Uh, and uh, that's why that fourth apparition does not happen on the 13th, but it's moved to the Feast of St. John Eudes on August 19th. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you lay that groundwork because uh, many are not aware of the, the hostility against things Catholic when Our Lady comes. And that tends to be a, a bit of a rule rather than an exception. I mean, we say the same thing in a certain de de degree about uh, Juan Diego and the atmosphere of the Aztecs. Uh, it was certainly the case in Medjugorje, which I personally believe to be authentic, uh, with uh, a communist government surrounding. So those should be signals of uh, precedence. Uh, Our Lady comes to those uh, in, in most need, uh, her children who are most persecuted. So well, let's let's go on uh, to the messages. And of course, we've got the three uh, children, the three uh, pastorinos, as they are called, the, the little shepherd kids. Uh, and again, I want to take the time for our viewers to hear these three messages, because the three angelic messages, two in 1916, and then one probably in 1970. It's also fascinating that they didn't date it because they didn't know even what month they were in, let alone what day they were in. These are these are shepherd kids. So radically different than our present, you know, 15 items per day scheduled on our, on our multiple calendars. But uh, the beginnings are angelic, which is also part of precedence. Oftentimes Our Lady sends angels, uh, sometimes St. Michael the Archangel, to prepare things for her uh, visits. But I, I think the theology in these three angelic apparitions are so conducive, so first cousin to the whole uh, idea of the Chaplet of Divine Mercy and its theology. But uh, if, if I can, let me uh, begin just by reading the first and then we can comment on it. So again, this is sometime in um, 1916, and uh, referred to uh, as the Angel of Peace, uh, eventually. Most would hold that this was, in fact, St. Michael the Archangel. So this is from Lucia's memoirs, uh, written to her bishop. She, uh, she says, quote, We spent the day there among the rocks, in spite of the fact that the rain was over and the sun was shining bright and clear. We ate our lunch and said our rosary. Our prayer finished, and we started to, to play pebbles. We had enjoyed the game for a few moments only when a strong wind began to shake the trees. We looked up, startled to see what was happening, for the day was unusually calm. Then we saw coming towards us above the olive trees the figure I have already spoken about. Yashinta and Francisco had never seen it before. Not had I ever mentioned it to them. As it drew near, we were able to distinguish its features. It was a young man, about 14 or 15 years old, whiter than snow, transparent as crystal when the sun shines through it, and of great beauty. On reaching us, he said, do not be afraid. I am the angel of peace. Pray with me. Kneeling on the ground, he bowed down until his forehead touched the ground and made us repeat these words three times. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I ask pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love you. Then rising, he said, quote, pray thus. The hearts of Jesus and Mary are attentive to the voice of your supplications. Extremely pregnant first message. Your, your thoughts, Robert? Yes. Well, 
I mean, an angel, of course, appeared to our Blessed Mother in the Annunciation, but now this is a kind of Annunciation of the coming of Mary, preparing them, I think, getting uh, preparing them to understand how the supernatural, uh, the, wor the other world, the spiritual world can break through. But then, you know, you see the theme, the hearts of Jesus and Mary. And I mean, we could, you, we, we all know that uh, St. Margaret Mary Alacoque had those uh, wonderful apparitions of our Lord promoting devotion to the sacred heart. But actually, even before uh, those apparitions in 1673, St. John Eudes had already uh, worked out the theology of the two hearts united so deeply. And he actually said next to the hypostatic union of the two natures in the one person of the word of God made flesh, the closest union we could imagine is the union of the hearts of Jesus and Mary. And he actually had uh, received permission to celebrate a mass and honor the most admirable heart of Mary. And he did that even before he worked out an office for a mass for the sacred heart of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, and that's so I think that, the theology of the two hearts was there, and here it comes in an angelic apparition, and of course, in uh, at the turn of the uh, the twentieth century, Leo the Thirteenth announced his consecration of the new century in eighteen ninety nine to the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and now a few years later, less than twenty years later, there's going to be the call, you know for the consecration uh, of the heart. It would come really uh, in 1929 more explicitly, but of the consecration of the world and especially Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. These two hearts are united uh, in, in love. And so that's what's so significant. But also in that prayer, looking at the background of the secularism, the Freemasonry, the denial of the supernatural, the denial of faith. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love thee. I beg pardon for those who do not believe, do not adore, do not hope, and do not love thee. This is a theme of Fatima. Interceding, praying, making sacrifices, uh, and doing reparation for the offenses against the hearts of Jesus and Mary by those who do not believe. I mean, oh. it, 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 you know, faith is such a gift and it's so beautiful to believe in our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Catholic Church. And <clears throat> But it's a, it must be so offensive and a wound to the heart of our Lord when he is offended and neglected and really blasphemed. And then since the hearts are so united, when the Blessed Mother is ignored and insulted and her uh, divine, her divinely given privileges are denied, there needs to be reparation to her Immaculate Heart as well. That's right. And that, that's what really hits the global map, if you will. You're absolutely right, Robert. St. John Hughes is just a master of the two hearts. In fact, he summarizes his theology of the two hearts by saying, you can best summarize that union along with his hypostatic union, you know, uh, analogy by saying there's really just one heart, one heart of Jesus and Mary, because the mother's heart beats one with his heart, with the heart of Jesus so profoundly. And, you know, I always find it adversarial when people try to separate the two hearts or they try to... Um, Obviously, we distinguish uh, one is a divine and human heart. The other is a human heart in, in the sense of the, the fullness of all that that means. At the same time, this is a God-made, directed, willed union of the two hearts. So competition, that idea is really from hell. That's a, that's a diabolical distraction to think that the hearts of Jesus or Mary are in competition. Uh, and the other thing that's really put on the map, uh, which is already there in, in, in Bridget of Sweden, and as you say, St. John Hughes and, and others to a smaller degree, lesser degree, is this idea of reparation, certainly with the sacred heart of Jesus, but reparation applied directly to the Immaculate Heart. 
that had not also been universal until it comes at Fatima. And, you know, I couldn't help but thinking as you're talking about the angelic preparation, well, what happens at the miraculous middle uh, apparitions? An angel prepares the St. Catherine, wakes her up. What happens uh, in Akita, Japan? An angel wakes uh, Sister Agnes Sasagawa up and tells her uh, to go to the chapel. Uh, and so th this is kind of, again, it, this is good solid precedence, but that prayer, I don't know about yourself, but uh, when I was uh, growing up, Robert, in the uh, in the 19th century, uh, there were many, almost typically you'd have some women in front of the Blessed Sacrament doing the Fatima prayers with their heads bowed, their head touching. Uh, and and doing the my my God I believe I adore and I always remember as a child wondering what are those ladies doing but it, this is the Fatima prayer and we're going to see this is only going to continue with this next apparition so uh, let's go to this second I mean we could almost do a, a whole dissertation just on these three anticipatory but there's so much of Fatima yet to cover let's go to this second apparition also uh, probably in 1916. Again, from Lucia's second memoir, quote, Some time passed and summer came when we had to go home for siesta. One day we were playing on the stone slabs of the well down at the bottom of the garden belonging to my parents. Suddenly we saw beside us the same figure, or rather angel, as it seemed to me. Quote, what are you doing? He asked. Pray, pray very much. The most holy hearts of Jesus and Mary have designs of mercy on you. Offer prayers and sacrifice constantly to the Most High. How are we to make sacrifices? I, this is Lucia, I asked. Quote, make of everything you can a sacrifice and offer it to God as an act of reparation for the sins by which he is offended and in supplication for the conversion of sinners. You will thus draw down peace upon your country. I am its angel guardian. The angel of Portugal, above all, accept and bear with submission the suffering which the Lord will send you. Again, it's just such a rich, supernatural, doctrinally theological, but also a really mystical message about the whole call of reparation. Your, your, your thoughts, Robert? Yes, exactly. We could see that uh, the message of reparation now is assuming great importance. It was there already. It's there scripturally rooted in Colossians 124, where St. Paul says, in my own flesh, I fill up what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. So, you know, sin has the uh, the effect. Uh, it has a double effect. You know, it, it, it affects our, our, uh, our salvation. And if we go to confession, uh, uh, the the grace is restored, but there's still the damage done by sin. Mm -hmm. Very much rooted the theology of the mystical body of Christ, where one part of the body is honored, the whole body is honored, where one part of the body suffers, the whole body suffers. So mm -hmm. sin affects the mystical body of Christ. And I know our, our separated brethren say, well, Jesus did it all. Jesus made reparation. Why do you have to make reparation? And the point is that we are mem living members of Christ's body, and he wants us to share. Why does he say, take up your cross and follow in my footsteps? That's right. You know, you know this is where we become uh, 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 participants, partners in the work of redemption, you know, co-redeemers in Christ. So this is all related there in, at, at Fatima, preparing even with the angelic apparitions and telling them to make prayers and sacrifices for the conversion of sinners and reparation to the hearts of Jesus and Mary. Yes, excellent, Robert. It, it, it's so foundational. And I think throughout this whole message, we'll see a vertical dimension, a, a, a humanity to God or to heaven dimension, the vertical, and then there's the horizontal dimension. That vertical dimension is reparation, how we're called to console our God, as Jesus would say to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque. And we'll see when we when we get to the five first Saturdays how specific Jesus is. It's, it's the child Jesus who speaks first about the need to console 
Our Lady's heart, which is outraged at every moment with ingratitude and blasphemies. Uh, but there's there's also this dimension where, uh, thanks be to God that Lucia asks the question of the angel, how do we make sacrifices? And then the answer is make up everything you can, but notice always the two intentions. First in reparation to God, and then what we'll see soon added is reparation to the Immaculate Heart specifically. But then there's the horizontal dimension. That's uh, in supplication for the conversion of sinners. That's co-redemption over and over and over, Robert. I mean, you you could no more take out co-redemption from the married message of the modern world uh, than you could, uh, you know, a, a backbone of an individual or a root uh, of, a, of a tree. That this is this is the whole call: reparation and co-redemption. And I also find it really um, spiritually uh, enlightening when the angel says, "Above all." most of all, accept the things that you cannot change. And I talk about a, a dissertation of, of mystical theology there. Uh, you know, what's what's harder to endure, fasting or a betrayal? Or fasting or hearing that you have a family member who has cancer that you can't change? Uh, I mean, so the interior penance is really the greatest of all. That's why Our Lady suffering at Calvary, why John Paul calls her the that she's spiritually crucified at Calvary because her heart is experiencing everything her son is experiencing and she can't stop that. But I, I find that whole dimension, Colossians 1.24, how are we to make up what is lacking the sufferings of Christ? By prayer, by sacrifice, and above all, by patiently enduring the things of our lives which we cannot change. That's right, that's right. And, and uh Pope Pius XI wrote an encyclical in 1928, uh, Miserentissimus uh, Redemptor, on reparation to the sacred heart of Jesus. But that theology could still apply to reparation to the immaculate heart of Mary. But it, he reminds us that all of our, the, the virtue or the power of reparation comes from the holy sacrifice of our Lord renewed at every mass and so it's not like we're in competition with the reparation of jesus no, right. but our separated brethren brethren doesn't uh, quite understand but this is what he said in miserenti uh, miserentissimus redemptor 1928 but we must ever remember that the whole virtue of the expiation depends on the one bloody sacrifice of christ which without intermission of time is renewed on our altars in an unbloody manner. So in other words, we're not in competition doing reparation, making up for what Jesus didn't do completely. No, we are united with his sacrifice renewed at every mass. Yeah, Robert, I, I mean, I, I wish we could kind of tattoo the word participation on, on foreheads and arms and just say, that's the privilege we have is we participate in the reparation that is done ultimately and infinitely by Jesus. And we participate in that reparation because he wants us to. That's the great privilege of our baptism. And Our Lady participates it, uh, in, in it in ways far beyond us because we're not immaculate. And so she is better prepared in that participation. Let's Let's lead now into this third angelic message, which is also, again, continues this richness, and now brings in a dimension of Eucharistic uh, reparation. The third apparition, uh, sometime in early 1917, quote, a considerable time had elapsed when one day we went to pasture our sheep on a property belonging to my parents. As soon as we arrived there, we knelt down with our foreheads touching the ground and began to repeat the prayer of the angel. My God, I believe, I adore, I hope, and I love you. I don't know exactly how many times we had repeated this prayer when an extraordinary light shone upon us. We sprang up to see what was happening and beheld the angel. He was holding a chalice in his left hand with the host suspended above it, from which some drops of blood fell into the chalice. Leaving the chalice suspended in the air, the angel knelt down beside us and made us repeat three times, quote, end quote, or in quote, I should say. Most Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I offer you the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. 
present in all the tabernacles of the world in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifferences with which he himself is offended, and through the infinite merits of his most sacred heart and the Immaculate Heart of Mary, I beg of you conversion of poor sinners. Then, rising, he took the chalice and the host in his hands. He gave the sacred host to me and shared the blood from the chalice between Yashinta and Francisco, saying as he did so, Take and drink the body and blood of Jesus Christ, horribly outraged by ungrateful men. Make reparation for their crimes and console your God. Once again, he prostrated on the ground and repeated with us three times more the same prayer, Most Holy Trinity, and then disappeared. I mean, really extraordinary Eucharistic reparation, this ongoing prayer, the angel giving them Holy Communion. Uh, so unpack it for us. Yes, I know. There's a lot of discussion. Where did he get, you know, did, did he take it from a tabernacle? Some people say that's what happened. Yeah. But we do know it. And it was really the first Holy Communion for Jacinta and, and Francisco. Uh, uh, Lucia had already received hers, but she receives it again. Uh, it's just remarkable, this prayer. Yeah. Because it, it's almost like a summary of the Catholic faith. What we hold, uh, uh, the, you know, most holy trinity, that great faith. But then I adore thee profoundly. But then I offer thee the most precious body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ present in all the tabernacles of the world. This idea of offering. Now, there are three, you know, children. They're not priests. Many, many Catholics have the idea that it, the offering is that of the priest. The priest makes present at every Mass the offering of Christ. He is the priest and the victim at every Mass. And we say, where does this language of body, blood, soul, and divinity come from? It comes from the Council of Trent. Yes, that's right. <laughs> so, the, so the angels well, knows the, you know, the councils very well. But then um, in reparation... So they're making an offering of the Eucharist in reparation for the outrages, sacrileges, and indifference by which he is offended. And then how do we do this? By the infinite merits of the sacred heart of Jesus and the immaculate heart of Mary, I beg the conversion of poor sinners. So here it, it reaffirms what was later said by Pius XI, that all the power or virtue of reparation comes from the sacrifice of Christ, our participation in it. But we are also able to offer that sacrifice even outside of the Mass. This is like at the, the Divine Mercy uh, chaplet prayer, you know, uh, uh, oh, um, that Eternal Father, I offer thee the body, blood, soul, and divinity of your dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. We could join in the offering, this eternal sacrifice, but was, you know, historically carried out on Calvary. But as the Council of Trent says, what was offered once in a bloody manner on the altar of Calvary is made present or represented at every mass right yeah i mean the idea you know if you want to flip this on its head the idea that these little kids could make up such a prayer with such sublime theology and uh and understanding of priesthood both ministerial and lay and I mean, it's, it's unfathomable a theologian would have a tough time making this up and you know robert the, the theme that seems to hit the 20th century is the priesthood of the laity, the royal priesthood, has to be exercised. Yeah. Uh, I was in uh, Great Britain o over the summer, and there's a whole symposium over there on the royal priesthood of the laity. But it's almost as if, as, as the 20th century enters, and Leo XIII gets that prayer of St. Michael uh, after that vision he has, of, or overhearing the dialogue between the father and the adversary of Satan, and that every time a priest offers mass, you know, light reflecting mercy 
is 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 brought to the Father so he can respond in mercy. Uh, that reparation, that that offering, offering leads to mercy rather than just a strict justice. But it's almost as if uh, in the 20th century, it becomes a universal call of exercising the priesthood of the laity, which can never replace the ministerial priesthood, which can never replace the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus. But there are different levels of participation. Participation, when you know an inferior being participates or, or shares in a quality of a superior being without adding, subtracting, taking anything away. It's not competition. It's a, it's a glorious sharing. And so it's as if in the 20th century and on into the 21st, this is now our responsibility okay. to offer already consecrated hosts, exercising our priesthood of the laity, to try to seek mercy from the Father instead of justice. And as you know, the world continues with more abortion and 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 more uh, ab abuse of children and uh, ill affecting of the the nature of family life, uh, let alone droning. I mean, uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the, the 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 dimension of um, trying to clone and and then the world scene where the drones are doing so. I mean, all of this is kind of a scary, brave new world. Of course, we have to be offering Jesus to the Father for more mercy, but it really comes. First, in these Fatima prayers. And then I was at a conference years back, and there was a sister from uh, St. Uh, Kowalska's uh, convent where, where, where Faustina had been a sister. And she reports, I don't know if this is even written, but she reported at this conference that Faustina said the second most important prayer in, in the realm of revelation are the prayers of the angels, the angel prayer at Fatima. Wow. So she saw the connection between that and, of course, the prayer of divine mercy. They're uh, they're so similar; they're easy to confuse as you're saying them. Yes, exactly, exactly. And and just to make sure to the listeners, this is solid Catholic theology that the laity can share in the offering. This was taught by Venerable Pius XII in his 1947 encyclical Mediator Dei. And he says that it, now it is clear that the faithful offer the sacrifices by the hands of the priest from the fact that the minister at the altar in offering a sacrifice in the name of all his members represents Christ, the head of the mystical body. Hence, the whole church can rightly be said to offer up the victim through Christ. And so we, we are united with Christ in his offering to the Father or Vatican II in Lumen Gentium 11. It says, taking part in the Eucharistic sacrifice, which is the fountain apex of the whole Christian life, they offer the divine victim to God and offer themselves along with it. So this is solid Catholic theology that the laity can join in the sacrifice of Christ. And it's critically important that we're aware of it so that we will do it. And I'm glad you made reference to Lumen Gentium's call. Not only do we offer the sacrifice with the priest, we offer ourselves. We, we put ourselves on the paten to be offered with Christ and the sacrifice of the priest for salvation. It's all about salvation. And, and this is why this idea of Jesus alone is so, so sad, really. It's a tragic idea because Jesus is the one saying, do this with me. Do this with me. I will do the lion's share because I'm the Lord, but I want you to participate in redemption. I want you to participate in reparation. I want you to participate in the conversion of sinners. And so to say, no, you're going to do it all is not what he wants. It, it doesn't please him. He's he's a big Jesus. He's not worried about competition from us. No. He's not worried about you and me offering a Friday of fasting. Somehow that's going to compete with what he did at Calvary. No, he can handle that. He is the God-man of love. And so he does it, but he wants us to share in such a missed opportunity. So Fatima, and again, we haven't even gotten to our ladies' messages yet. The Fatima angelic call is this call of reparation and co-redemption. And I can't think of two better words that summarize the overall reference. Again, reparation is what we do to God, consoling his heart with our acts of love, 
And we're going to see this extend to Our Lady with reparation to her Immaculate Heart. Co-redemption is this constant call for the conversion of sinners. We are responsible. It's kind of like the, the question God asks, you know, uh, or, or Cain responds to the Father. Am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes. Yes, we are our brother's keeper. We are called to be concerned about the salvation of our brother. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, we have that wonderful scripture, Colossians 1.24. I don't think there's any better commentary on that scripture than the 1984 apostolic letter, Salvifici Dolores, of St. John Paul II. And he confronts right on that question is, is this implying that Christ's sacrifice on the cross was not all sufficient? He says, no, no. But on the level of love, Christ wished to open up his sacrifice to all human suffering. And, and so he, he says, in the Paschal mystery, Christ began the union with man in the community of the church. The sufferings of Christ created the good of the world's redemption. This good in itself is inexhaustible and infinite. No man can add anything to it. But at the same time, in the mystery of the church as his body, Christ has, in a sense, opened up his own redemptive suffering to all human suffering, insofar as man becomes a sharer in Christ's suffering in any part of the world and at any time in history. To that extent, he, in his own way, completes the suffering through which Christ accomplished the redemption of the world. Extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And and I love that. I always... I was in Rome when that that apostolic letter came out. I always thought it was second only to Scripture. I mean, it's so profound. His salvifici dolores on the on the Christian meaning of human suffering, but this so has to do with everything. That's why Fatima is such a co-redemption message. I mean, as we will talk about, you know, Our Lady will appear as Our Lady of Sorrows uh, during the solar miracle, but the whole message is a concern about saving others. So when John Paul the second says your co-redeemers in Christ, when Pius XI said it before him, when Bishop, when, uh, excuse me, uh, Pope Benedict says it at Fatima, I call you to be redeemers, you know, with the Redeemer. How can this be denied, Robert? This is not just a, a light variable of one theologian's opinion. This is so central to Catholic and Marian understanding that it, it, it's really, there's no way this could be up for grabs. Co-redemption is here to say it's at the heart of the faith. And of course, Our Lady does it like no one else. Exactly. And, and this is something that has to be taught and appreciated. It's, a, it's amazing that an angel would teach this through the children. I mean, I was at a, at a Marian conference recently, and a very good priest gave a talk, and I had spoken about reparation. And he said, I'm very glad you spoke about that. I never learned this in the seminary. Uh, yeah. Doesn't that hurt? I mean, thanks be to God, it's a positive. But I have asked students for the last, you know, it's going to be 40 years next year of teaching at university level. I have asked every group of students, about 6,500 students, for just from Mariology, have you heard a teaching or a homily on reparation? And I would dare say not 25 students out of that 6,000 plus students raise their hands. And, and, and so for whatever reason, we have to restore this because this is the Fatima message, but it's also critical Catholic teaching on the mystical body and on co-redemption. Uh, I'm gonna give you the last word, Robert. We're gonna, I'm gonna close it here because uh, there's so much to Fatima. I wanna dedicate several uh, programs to it, but I think it's apropos that we do a whole, program just on the angelic apparitions because they're almost categorically skipped over. But your your last words on the importance of this. Yes. Well, I think, first of all, we have to have a great uh, spirit of thanksgiving for the gift of Fatima. And really, at the crucial time it came, the world was at war. There were these movements of secularization, you know, the Bolshevik revolution occurring in, in Russia at that time. This was a critical time. But the weapons we have are spiritual mm -hmm. and we could participate not just by 
you know, words, but by prayer and sacrifice. What a great honor it is to share with Christ in his work of redemption. And we'll have to talk about the notion of uh, reparation to the hearts of Jesus and Mary, because there's, there's, of course, the idea that our sacrifices can console the heart of Jesus there at the, uh, you know, the agony in the garden and on the cross. He was aware of all, all, all of our sacrifices uh, that gave him comfort and solace. But there is, in a certain sense, that Christ continues to have sorrow. He has a human heart in his, uh, you know, in his glorified body. And the Blessed Mother also has feelings. You know, if some people say, well, she has the beatific vision. How could you combine, you know, sorrow? And she's shown weeping at La Salette. And then, and then the, you know, then, then the miracle at, in Syracuse, uh, Sicily, you know, the, the, the weeping image. And but Pius XII brought that out uh, in a radio message, you know, uh, to, uh, to the people in Syracuse on the anniversary, the year anniversary of that. But uh, that, what, what did he say? Well, he said, Mary is not without feeling. Yes, she's in a sense without suffering or pain now, not physical suffering, but in her heart, which is still bodily, what mother could not feel and see uh, feel for the suffering of her children on earth so she has feeling and it's it's a suffering it's a it's a type of sadness and sorrow and i think our lord's heart too i mean two popes we know have quoted uh, pascal saying jesus will be in agony until the end of the world That's john right. paul II and 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 benedict the 16th and and pope francis wrote a whole uh, apostolic letter on pascal and Robert, I think that's why, and I'm, I'm so glad you, we end this first segment on Fatima on this note. That's why, yes, of course, it can be theologically justified that we are going to be offering prayers and sacrifices directly to the Immaculate Heart to assist her whilst during her suffering on earth. At the same time, there is a consistent um, testimony in these church-approved apparitions, I remember talking to Cardinal Gagnon, who was a very saintly cardinal from Montreal, and he said, hey, of course they're suffering now. That's the message of the Sacred Heart to St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, and they continue to mystically suffer. Why? Because of their prominence in the body. Jesus is the head of the body. Mary's the heart of the body. She's the mother of the body. So we know that it's theologically possible to have both the beatific vision and suffering because Jesus does it on Calvary. Jesus has the beatific vision on Calvary and he suffers massively in an unprecedented way. So those are not incompatible. So it might be considered a quote honor uh, for our lady who has the beatific vision to also experience his suffering. Ergo the tears, ergo, you know, places where she will step aside from the cross uh, and, uh, you know, even be in front of the cross, and she will experience, you know, the wounds, uh, and 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 you can see pain on her face. So this is an ongoing theme, and and that will bring be brought to a, a kind of a climactic dimension within the theology and the practice of the five first Saturdays. So Robert, thank you, uh, outstanding. It's always uh, a challenge for me when we don't appreciate. The angelic apparitions of Fatima because of the richness of our, what our lady says. But fortunately, we can go to that richness in our next program. And in our next program, I want to focus too on what I consider to be the single most important Marian message of the 20th century. And that's her July 13th, 1917 message, where she speaks about uh, the vision of hell, the remedy, uh, which is her immaculate heart consecration to her immaculate heart, the call to Russia, and even revealing the third secret of Fatima, which is not revealed in 1917, but it's revealed in 2000. So talk about a message where it talks about the Holy Father will have much to suffer, but the quintessential promise which guides this whole age, and that is, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph and a period of peace will be granted to the world. So uh, for our uh, viewers, stay with us for our next program as we talk about these dimensions uh, on Fatima. Robert, thank you as always for your invaluable insights. And uh, we will continue to try to unpack th this 
incredibly pregnant and rich uh, message of Fatima. So important for then, so very important for now. Thanks so much for being with us in a masterclass in Mariology. God bless you all.